Hey Hacksters, welcome to Tuesday. I have with me Robert and Sahaj uh, from the 96 boards within Lenaro. How's it going guys? Hello, hi, great, thank you, how are you? Uh, oh, I'm marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, that thing that I just said about the 96 boards team within Lenaro, what are those two things, 96 boards and Lenaro, can you explain? Yeah, so uh, Lenaro is the parent company of 96 Boards, and uh, Lenaro is a software company based out of the UK, founded in 2010, and uh, running strong till today. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, from its inception, uh, it, was, it was kind of geared towards reducing the fragmentation and redundancies in the Linux ecosystem on ARM. So oh. that's kind of the, the original goal of Lenaro. And it's, it's evolved, so Lenaro does a lot of things now, and um, you know you can pretty much go search online to find out all of the, the little things it does. Neat. And we're talking about the Ultra 96 board. So that is uh, a N96 board. Is that correct? What what exactly is that? What is 96 boards? So 96 boards, like I mentioned, uh, Lenaro is the parent company of 96 boards. I'll give a little a little history as to why 96 boards kind of came to be. Uh, it's a specification that was developed back in uh, 2012, and it was kind of to eliminate the long lead times and high cost of ARM development platforms. Mm. So but back in the day, you used to have to spend a lot of money and you used to have to wait a long time if you wanted to get your hands on this kind of hardware. So um, taking into account that Lenaro is a member-based company, partners all kind of got together and said, we want to develop a spec that people can put these different SOCs on and give the power to the developers. And so they all came together and put this spec together. And now you're starting to see, you know, as you can tell, just a whole bunch of different SOCs on this uh, very unified form factor. Perfect. So each company doesn't have to develop their own development board from scratch to show off a new system on chip. They can just sort of throw it into this defined format. And there you go. And it'll work with all these peripherals and stuff. For the most part, I mean, it's a little easier said than done. The, mm. the software story is is still slightly, or still needs a little bit of work, but um, for the most part, when you create a 96 boards, if you follow the specification, you are adopting the entire ecosystem. So yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I, I'll show some stuff off later. I have some tech here on my desk, but you talked about it in your live stream yesterday uh, about all the different mezzanine boards, you know, comparing to the Raspberry Pi hats the capes for the beagle bone. Um, you can basically take these mezzanines and you can adopt the ecosystem uh, onto uh, the Ultra 96, you know, be it as we're welcoming it into the 96 boards ecosystem. Cool, perfect segue, by the way. <laughs> what is the Ultra 96? <laughs> Why is this created? We talked about it in the uh, overview yesterday, but we're gonna get some demos today, right? What does it do? So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna give a, a brief introduction to the Ultra 96, but then Sahaj is gonna talk a little bit more about the, the technical aspects of it, you know, more of the features and, and the spec of it. Beautiful. But um, the Ultra 90, yeah, the Ultra 96 is um, is a joint effort between Xilinx, where the SOC came from, Avnet, where basically it's gonna be distributed and made. Yeah, Avnet hacks their woo. <laughs> and, and, um, they, they of course used the 96 board specification to kind of unify all of this together. So um, in general, I will say that Avnet and Xilinx have been amazing partners so far. Uh, their attention to detail, the support that they've given around the Ultra 96. I have mine right here too, right? Ooh. So uh, the support they've given to the Ultra 96 and, and the attention that they've given, I, I can definitely see um, a lot going on in the future for this board, especially um, in the community. So I, I, I didn't want to waste, I didn't want to talk too much about the technical specs because I think I'll give that over to Sahaj. Marvelous. Lay it on us. Hello, um, I'm Sahaj and I work as an applications engineer uh, at 96 Boards in Monaro. So if, if we talk about the very basic uh, part of the Ultra 96, which is the MPSOC, the Xilinx Ultra Scale MPSOC, now it's a very special kind of a process. It's not your generic phone processor. It's, uh, it has a lot of components, starting with the ARM core. So you have four 64-bit regular uh, ARM cores, which is the Cortex A53, is running at 1.5 gigahertz. Then you have something that are called real-time processors. Um, these are more for sensor data analysis or uh, you know data acquisition and you know uh, robotics and stuff like that, where timing is of uh, very much of importance. So these are separate processors. They can be programmed separately, uh, and these are Cortex R5 uh, 
uh, we have two of these as well. We have the Mali 400 MP2 GPU. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, even uh, after all of this, we have the programmable logic, which is your FPGA part. And it's not a wimpy little programmable logic. It is a fairly powerful one uh, with around uh, 100, uh, I think it was 150 uh, logical cells or units, uh, which is basically how, how much hardware can you fit into that programmable logic. How much can you design so yes it's it's uh, kind of a, a lot of things in a very small uh, package um, and that is what makes it very special in that manner um a, a bit more on the specs we have two gigs of ram uh, lpdd of four uh, we have wi-fi and bluetooth we have a mini display port which uses mm. these writings uh, ip for mini display port and it's, it's all built into the fpga uh, and cool. then we have we have a micro B USB 3 port, uh, which is for the OTG uh, on the go micro USB and two USB 3 ports and your uh, 40 and 60 pin uh, low speed and high speed connectors uh, on board. So yeah, it's a pretty neat little package uh, with a powerful FPG on board. Mm. Yeah, and if, if I could add something to that, is that okay, Alex? Totally. Yeah, so, um, you know, Sahaj did mention, right, so I have the, the Ultra 96 right here pointing out um, a little bit more. What Sahaj was kind of talking about were all the main components that, you know, most people are interested in, right? But for people who would be interested in some of the more basic stuff, like the I.O., uh, you have uh, the low-speed header, the high-speed header, of course, some USB ports, uh, what he mentioned about the mini display port, and then your OTG port, which links you out to your host machine. But um, what's important to note with the things I just mentioned there is that these are the main components that kind of link this board to the 96 boards ecosystem. Mm. So um, if you were to go look at the 96 boards consumer edition specification, these are the main items that uh, will allow uh, this board to adopt the ecosystem. Likewise, any developers that are working with this board, if you were to create accessories, 3D printed models, anything that you want to contribute to the ecosystem, it could also be consumed by the other boards as well, right? So, um, you know, working with the Ultra 96 bridges the gap between the Ultra 96 and everything else too. So it's kind of like a give take um, uh, with, with working with one of these boards. Fabulous. <clears throat> So Sahaj, you mentioned the Mali uh, component, and that's often used in AI devices. Is that, is that correct? Uh, well, uh, in this, the Mali GPU is only powerful enough to give a decent enough display output. Okay, so cool. all the AI and everything that's related to neural networks goes in the FPG, and that's where Zilinx and oh. uh, Avnet is kind of pushing it is FPGA-based uh, AI. Uh, and it's fairly different from a GPU based one, which are usually you know, kind of the main thing here, uh, the, main, uh, the main hardware which is used in AI these days. And the thing with FPGAs is that it doesn't do a whole lot of uh, things you know, sequentially, it does everything parallelly and you can yeah. have like multiple sensors, push the data into the FPGA for processing and it doesn't really have to kind of wait for all the sensor data to come in, process it. Um, there's like even with the GPU, only the AI bit is kind of the one that you can, you know, really have multiple streams going from, you know, multiple processors working on the AI solution. G GPUs are like hundreds of thousands of processors. Right. Uh, through the cores, right? So, but well, if the, the other two points of the GPU when the data comes up and the data goes, uh, comes in and the data goes out, those are all still sequential. Uh, because that's the, the CPU is doing that. Mm. Uh, with the FPGA, it's uh, everything's kind of parallelly happening, so it doesn't really have to wait for the sense uh, the all the sensor data to be collected and then pushed into the FPGA. Um, Wonderful, uh, uh, Alex. Have you have you done any videos um, on FPGA by chance? Like I actually, yeah, I just did a series of four videos. Uh, there was an intro to FPGA that briefly mentioned this board, but didn't really go into it. Uh, and then there were three other uh, FPGA boards that I highlighted, which was the Tiny FPGA, the uh, Upduino, and the Beagle Wire Cape for BeagleBone. So uh, we've gone into it a little bit, and people can totally explore those if they're curious. But I'm really excited to bring this uh, up as well. So this is the thing I was talking about. Um, these, these diagrams are from uh, embeddedcomputing.com, and these are actually pretty good ones to show that you know you still have your 
all the data come in and go in a, in a batch basically and wherein with the FPGA you can just have uh, data input and output fairly parallel and that kind of lowers the latency a lot. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it's an, I think it's important to note, you know, like just talking about FPGAs in general, right? But yeah, uh, you know, with an FPGA, you're not using the processor to say communicate with a peripheral, right? You're actually writing the hardware uh, to uh, create that connection between the peripheral, which can eliminate a lot of latency. And mm -hmm. in AI, and especially AI machine learning, um, these types of applications or this vertical, uh, there is so much that can be done um, with the FPGA. Not only that, is that you know when it comes to prototyping, using an FPGA can be a lot more cost efficient than just taping out your own your own oh, processor, yeah. right? So I mean, you can eliminate a lot of a lot of cost by you know doing your uh, initial development on an FPGA, which is very nice. And yeah. this the cost of this board is also very <laughs> enticing. Yeah, I'm yeah. going a bit kind of out uh, out of context here, but since you are talking about FPGA, just for a second, the they are actually coming into market as well uh, in, in in products, especially where the use cases aren't that much. They are, people are not going to sell that much that, that many units. So instead of just fabricating a specialized ASIC for your product, you know, people just put in FPGAs. It's much mm. cheaper. Beautiful. So speaking of, there's so much you can do with them. How about we look at some of these demos? <laughs> 